Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Corn Board. Growing more with less is the mantra of Nebraska's corn farmers, and they're using incredible technology to do it. Soil moisture monitors let them know when their crop needs water and how much. GPS systems eliminate overlaps in the field, saving fuel and money. New hybrids reduce the use of pesticides and increase yields. When you're talking new technology and innovation, Nebraska corn farmers are all ears. Nebraska's family corn farmers, sustaining innovation. Market Journal, television for agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine, and major funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Corn Board. Welcome to this week's edition of Market Journal. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. We're reporting this week from the 2016 Power Farming Show at the Lancaster Event Center in Lincoln. On this episode, Mike Briggs looks at cattle prices. Greg Ibot talks about ag exports to China. Scott Irwin examines volumes for the renewable fuel standard. And Tina Barrett talks about costs of production for the 2017 crop. Mike Briggs is our cattle market analyst this week. U.S. farmers and ranchers produced 4% more beef in October compared to a year ago, and that was with one fewer day in the month than October 2015. Nebraska increased its output by 3% and accounted for a quarter of the country's total supply. November's cattle on feed report did show 5% fewer animals in the state's feedlots than in November 2015, and placements during October were 5% lower than the previous year. American beef and veal exports for October were up 17% from October 2015 and the best total since August 2014. We talked with Mike Wednesday morning and began by asking about recent market price movements. Things have gotten considerably better. We went from 97 cents all the way back to about a buck 15. So that's a tremendous rally in a short period of time. The interesting thing to me is we've really narrowed our spread with the packer. We were selling cattle under choice or under select, and we've actually got our back to where we're kind of in the middle between choice and select, where I think we should be most of the time. So it feels like you're getting a little bit more of a fair price for your cattle. Cattle are getting to where maybe they're not making any money, but at least you're breaking even or getting close to. Now, as we go forward here, I think you could actually see some profitability return to the cattle feeding industry. I don't know for how long, but for a short period of time, I think we could have some profitability return. What led to the market rally there? We were way undervalued, and we usually have a seasonal rally this time of year, and so we've gotten those two things. It was way undervalued, so you had it, had it revaluation from that, and then because you usually have a good run in this time of the year. What about the supply of cattle? Supply of fat cattle is short, and that's the other thing that's helped us. You know, they talked all fall, oh, we're going to get short on cattle. Again. We never did because people drug them along, but actually now we've got a little bit shorter on cattle. Now, the nice thing would be is if we could lower our weights because our weights are, um, we're, are adding to the total beef supply, and that's hurting us. So tell me more about the weights of cattle both entering and exiting the feedlot. Going out of the feedlot are still very high. They're not as high as last year. We're still a few pounds under last year, but unless, you know, this flip in the weather here may help that because we were having such tremendous feeding weather and we we're putting on a lot of extra pounds. Well, this little weather snap is going to curtail that. That'll take the top off of that deal. So hopefully we've seen our peak in our weights and maybe they'll go down a little bit. Hopefully not from the disastrous what type of weather we had last year, but hopefully they'll go down, go down a little bit. Cattle coming into the feed yard aren't quite as small as they've been because you've seen a lot of ranchers did not want to get rid of their cattle because the prices were so low and they were undervalued. So they've kept them, put a little weight on them. Now prices are back. You've seen excellent movement into the sale barns and a lot of movement into the feed yards. Where last month you saw placements way under last year, I think this next month you're going to see placements over last year. How full are feedlots right now? There's still a lot of empty yards. We're pretty full. I know some yards that are full and I hear quite a few yards are not. And that's, that's, there's a function of a lot of that. A lot of it's financial, a lot of it's lack of cattle coming to the market. 
I think there's going to be a tsunami of feeder cattle come to the market after the first year, and that's going to be really interesting to see how the market deals with that. What are the roles right now for foreign and domestic demand? Foreign and domestic demand. Domestic demand has actually been very good in holding up even though the prices in the stores haven't come down like we'd like. Now you have seen the retailer feature some things and I think when they do that they probably see some pretty impressive movement on it. So that's been good. The really good thing is you've seen deme or foreign demand come up. We're way over last year in exports and I think you're going to continue to see that especially if the dollar would roll over. How expensive are feed costs right now and uh, what's the impact to margins? Corn is, corn is a lot cheaper than it's been in several years and that's helping with margins and I think corn will remain cheap. Um, there's abundance of it around. Now it is one of the cheaper feed grains in the world so you should see good export movement but we can't export at all. Now ethanol producers have great margins so they're going full crank. So you're seeing a lot of demand with the corn but there's an awful lot out there so I don't see corn going anywhere fast. As you look back on 2016, Mike, what was the year like overall for the feeding industry? Very tough. You saw a decrease, you know, you saw an all-time record drop in cattle prices. They dropped 45% from their high. That's never happened before. You saw a lot of stress in the feeding industry, and you saw a lot of things that perplexed us, where we got so deeply undervalued on the cattle. How you saw all the volatility in the futures market, that's still an issue that needs to be addressed. There's entirely too much volatility in the futures market and the change in valuation that does not, not have anything to do with fundamentals. And those two issues still need to be addressed. I think as we go forward, there's still a lot of protein in the market. I think there's gonna be opportunities for margin in the future, but you're still gonna to have to be pretty prudent in how you do it and you're gonna to have to protect them because I believe that the volatility is going to come back next summer. Next week, Roy Smith will join us to look at corn and soybean markets. Governor Pete Ricketts, Department of Ag Director Greg Ibaugh, and a delegation of other Nebraskans recently returned from a trade mission to China. The world's most populous country is Nebraska's fourth largest trading partner and has the potential for further growth. China announced in September it would move to lift its ban on American beef in place for nearly 13 years after a case of BSE was found in the U.S. The market there has exploded during that time. China imported $15 million worth of beef in 2003. In 2015, it brought in a record $2.3 billion. China has also overtaken Japan as the world's largest pork importer. American product accounts for 17 percent of that supply. We talked with Greg at our recent roadshow event in Kearney about the outlook for ag trade and the potential for ag exports to China. The opportunity, I believe, is still very great for agriculture exports uh, into China. You know, it's just such a huge country, 1.3 billion plus plus people and getting bigger every day. Uh, more middle class, more people wanting a, a higher quality diet, more protein in their diet. And even though they're trying to uh, increase their productivity, there's just a limited amount of arable land, uh, resources um, for human food versus livestock food, and so there continues to be opportunity. So how optimistic are you about the opportunity for U.S. and Nebraska beef finally getting into, or again getting into China? Well, we're probably more optimistic. I personally am more optimistic now at any time in the different uh, ebbs and flows of the, the talk of maybe U.S. beef getting back in since it was banned in 2003, that something might happen in the near future. And so that definitely was part of the discussion while we were in China that, you know, telling the Nebraska beef story, talking about the fact that, uh, you know, we're one of the few states that have the high, uh, in the entire chain right here in our state that, you know, we can grant you a uh, product that is um, uh, very high quality, very safe from family farms. And, you know, we get pork in right now, and so we continue to talk about our pork industry as well. What are the challenges that come with trying to export into China, whether it be a product that's already established or uh, things like GMOs that have received approval here but not necessarily in China? So I think, you know, a lot of farmers and ranchers are concerned with the new administration coming in, and, you know, both candidates uh, is, were skeptical about trade in general and making sure we had good agreements. 
And I think that uh, China is one of those marketplaces that while it has a huge opportunity, I think there are definitely some things we can point to where we don't really have a normal trade relationship. You know, we all have shipments blocked because of, you know, they'll test and find something that they object to uh, at one time, but for the next six months then they won't worry about that. And so I think you can kind of match domestic supply uh, issues with the way they accept imports at times. And so I think there's definitely some room with a new administration to sit down and say, hey, let's, let's figure out what that you're part of the WTO, so are we. Let's follow those rules more closely. You know, we recently filed a, 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 a complaint against them through the WTO as well. We've also recently seen that uh, President-elect Trump has decided to go away from TPP once he gets into office in 2017. How concerning is that? What are the opportunities that that presents without TPP? Well, hopefully, uh, that there's still a path forward because we need trade agreements with uh, those countries either through a multilateral multi-nation approach like TPP or through bilateral agreements and we know even within agriculture there were you know portions of the pork industry that had concerns about the uh, the Japanese uh, uh, subsidies of their pork production uh, tobacco had some issues with TPP, uh, the dairy industry had some concerns about TPP uh, with as far as even Canada went. And so through NAFTA or TPP there there's some things we can fix there but hopefully you know signaling that we don't like the current agreement maybe we can go back now and open up that agreement and say okay what would it take for the United States to get comfortable, what would it take for us to to make some changes and maybe that can happen and then we can bring back a new and improved TPP or maybe we negotiate some bilateral agreements with very important countries like Vietnam and, and uh, Japan and South Korea to get to where we want to be. We also talked with Greg on our previous episode of Market Journal about farm finances in Nebraska and results of a recent survey on that subject. You can find that in our December 2nd show on the Market Journal website. The Environmental Protection Agency will require refiners to blend more than 19 billion gallons of renewable fuel in 2017, an increase of more than a billion gallons from 2016. Of that, 15 billion gallons will come from conventional renewables, commonly corn-based ethanol. The agency released its renewable fuel standard volumes the day before Thanksgiving. The Energy Independence and Security Act of 2007 initially set a target of 36 billion gallons of renewable fuel by 2022, the final year of the requirement. The goal for conventional biofuel was to hit and stay at 15 billion gallons in 2015, which the EPA has now achieved. Scott Irwin is an ag economist at the University of Illinois who studies the RFS. He joined us Monday to discuss 2017's levels, starting with what they say about the so-called E10 blend wall. Well, they continue to give a push above that E10 blend wall in the standards, in the sense that those are continuing to be set a bit above the actual physical E10 blend wall. So does this put more uh, emphasis on higher blends of ethanol like 15, 30, and 85? At least in theory, it does, uh, but we've actually seen in recent years that those kinds of blends have not been growing very rapidly. They may further down the line, but I wouldn't expect large growth in the next year or two. So how do they fill that gap in the meantime? One word, biodiesel. Um, and that's the real story coming out of the latest rulemaking by the EPA is the big boost this more than likely gives biodiesel. So why is it so bright for that industry? Well, uh, because it's an advanced biofuel, which means that it's a basically higher ranked biofuel than corn-based ethanol because it gets a higher score in terms of reducing greenhouse gases. So it can do two things. Uh, it can be used to fulfill the advanced component of the standards as well as the gap between the E10 blend wall and the ethanol mandate itself. Is the biodiesel industry advanced enough that it can meet the requirements? Uh, yes, although uh, that answer requires uh, acknowledging the role that 
imports into the United States have played in the last couple of years. We've seen very heavy imports of both uh, traditional biodiesel and renewable diesel, and those have been important in helping to fulfill that demand for biomass-based diesel, which is the technical name for that category. What do you think the outlook is for renewable fuels and the RFS with the new administration in the White House and a new head of the EPA? Very interesting questions. A lot of speculation swirling around those issues. On one hand, uh, President-elect Trump uh, has much of his, uh, the fact that he was elected, uh, it's based on his success in Midwestern states where there's a lot of ethanol support. And on the other hand, he's clearly shown uh, an interest in some of the arguments made by those coming out of the oil refining business about some of the perceived problems of the RFS. So it's difficult to know how this is all going to play out. My own personal guess, Jeff, is that you'll see probably a little less aggressive implementation of, in particular, the advance mandate going forward, but the rest of the RFS is unlikely to be touched, in my opinion. When we talked a year ago, Scott, you thought that the EPA would go to 15 billion gallons for that conventional fuel mandate. If I were to ask you about years after that, what do you think the forecast looks like? This one's an easy one, even for an economist with a poor track record like myself uh, on prices and forecasting. Uh, in all seriousness, uh, I don't see any reason why it won't stay at 15 billion gallons going forward because uh, rising gasoline use uh, continues to get closer and closer to that maximum 15 billion gallons. If you're interested in learning more about 2017's levels and the original intent of the RFS, we'll link to more resources on the Market Journal website. The December Nebraska farmer says about 40,000 acres of plenish high oleic soybeans were contracted this year through Ag Processing Inc. of Hastings. Ken Boswell, who farms near Shickley, planted 60 acres of plenish soybeans this year. This month's magazine says growers like Boswell have reported yields comparable to commodity beans of the same maturity ranges and similar varieties in their area. You can read more about high oleic soybeans and the farmers who grew them for the first time in Nebraska this season in the December Nebraska Farmer. As we mentioned in the previous episode of Market Journal, the USDA's updated financial forecast for 2016 dropped U.S. net farm income to its lowest level since 2009. While receipts from crops are expected to be close to 2015, the agency sees a bigger shot coming to livestock sectors. It projects receipts from cattle and calves will be 15 percent lower, and those from hog production will slide 7 percent. At last week's Market Journal Roadshow events, Tina Barrett from Nebraska Farm Business Inc. discussed how producers could better position themselves during the downturn. We talked with her at Nebraska Innovation Campus in Lincoln and began by asking how current conditions are affecting debt, cost of family living, and overall net worth. Net worth is something that we built a lot of over the last few years with a lot of profitability on, on average anyway. Um, you know, and so the, yeah, that's a nice bright spot is that there's a lot of equity on balance sheets right now. What's the downhill slope look like for net farm income? You know, so I mean, it's a pretty steep decline, but we've got to remember we started at unprecedented levels. So, you know, it's hard to, to look at where we're at going, oh, this was awful compared to four years ago, but where we were four years ago was unbelievable. And so um, you got to kind of take that in with a grain of salt, too, and, and understanding that this isn't that different than it was 15, 20 years ago. How has that then affected debt levels on the farm? Okay, so debt, you know, it's funny because, you know, we went through this, this nice long profitability time where you'd think debt was going down and we were getting a, a healthier position. And in the reality, we more than doubled debt. Um, so from a, a debt to asset standpoint, we're still doing well, um, which means we've built a lot of assets as well. But each acre of ground is covering twice as much debt as it was 10 years ago now. Um, and so from a risk factor, it, it's considerably higher. In retrospect, was there anything that could have, been, could have been done differently to make the situation different? Well, you know, I mean, I think the thing that was really tough, uh, and it's always tough for producers, is wanting to pay taxes. But when we really think about principal being a non-deductible expense, we have got to have taxable income high enough to cover family living and income taxes, which again are not deductible, and principal payments that we want to make. And, and it's a hard concept to think that we got to pay taxes to reduce debt, 
because it doesn't make sense to spend money to have less to pay down. But we really have to think about that. And, and now that it's tough is that we've done so much tax deferral over the last few years, didn't pay tax when we were making money, now we don't have cash, and we really need to pay taxes. Tell me about the trends in family living. Yeah, so actually I can say that family living is down over the last few years. Um, has been Congratulations. Down. Yeah, yeah, it's good news. <laughs> but the reality is it's $92,000, and that's down from ninety nine, but still more than double what it was 10 years ago. Um, and, you know, just to kind of give a little perspective on what 92000 of family living means is, you know, I went backwards to figure what kind of salary it would take to have a take-home check of 92000 and I put in a 5% to retirement and $1,000 a month for a mortgage or, or car payment. Um, and you need a $160,000 a year salary. You know, so I think that kind of is like a, oh man, you know, understanding that uh, the average operation out there is living way beyond what most um, jobs would pay in, in rural Nebraska. Let's flip to looking at this year. So 2017 growing season, as you start to look at costs of production, tell me what they look like. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty tough, right? We're not in the market of what the cash market's paying right now. It's just for, on average, just not there. Now, I do have some producers who are um, producing at levels below cash prices right now. So, I mean, we've got guys who are, are making money, uh, and that's good. Um, it's just tough to figure out from an individual operation standpoint where you're at. Because average doesn't make it, which means half of them are way out and half of them might be in the money. So, uh, you need to know where you're at um, so that you can know if you need to be making adjustments quickly or if you can be sitting and kind of hanging onto your seat through this. Why is there so much variability? Well, you know, there's a lot of difference in managers out there. and I. I think a lot of times producers think that they are all in the same boat and everybody's doing the same thing because we're dealing with, with so much the same. But the reality is there's a lot of decisions that they make every day. And you know they choose which seed company to use, they're choosing how much fertilizer to apply, they're choosing all the little things that go along with the operation. And for those who focus on making those good decisions on a daily basis, which is hard because it's a discipline thing, um, that, that we can really see a big difference in total costs. Um, you know, sometimes it's a matter of, of having, you know, a great setup that you come in. Some producers certainly have, you know, a longer family history, maybe ground that's paid for, favorable cash rents that, that the, maybe their neighbor doesn't have. Um, and so sometimes that's the difference. But, but I really see a difference even in, in brothers who have the same setup and their cost production might be 30 or 40 cents different because of those little decisions that they're making. Those producers you mentioned that could be making a profit this year, what sets them apart from the other group? You know, I, I think it's an attention to, the, to those details. It's paying attention to the numbers. A lot of producers don't want to think about their farm as a business. It's more of a lifestyle. Um, and when you take the time to really look at those numbers and, and react to what those numbers are telling you, you can make good decisions. So, you know, think about if you had a cash flow that had a positive, the 100,000, that might feel like, oh, it got some wiggle room, no problem. We can, we can play with some of this money. But if it was a negative 100,000 and you knew that, then it's, you think, oh, I don't think I need that $50 tool, or I don't need, you know, to, to upgrade the tractor this year. Um, and so having that knowledge really gives you the power to make better decisions. Now with this week's weather forecast, here's Nebraska Extension Ag Climatologist, Al Dutcher. Well, folks, here we begin for the weekly forecast. Of course, the big news was the Arctic intrusion into our region and, of course, some of the accumulating snow that fell last Saturday completely missed by our models when we were putting the taping together. Although as we got closer to the event, of course the model started to pick up on the precipitation and actually lifted the precipitation shield that we talked about last week in terms of the initial forecast, about 100 to 150 miles toward the northwest. And so we did see some accumulating snowfall the first of the year for southeastern and south central Nebraska. As we go forward in time, we have several opportunities for accumulating snowfall and the best locations will be across northeast Nebraska in the near term. And then of course we'll start to see a shift toward more central and southern Nebraska as we go through the end of the weekend. We'll get to that in a second, but the one thing I want to draw your attention to is the latest of the precipitation maps for the month of November. And as we go to the map, one thing I'll draw your attention to that this is radar estimated precipitation. So these are not uh, quality control with ground truth, but you will notice that most of the heavier precipitation that is greater than a half an inch fell in a very narrow band 
in central Nebraska, south central Nebraska, and then portions of northeast Nebraska. And we do have a little bit of hail contamination. We knew we had a couple of severe thunderstorms that did develop and an isolated tornado that developed during the month of November in this area where we've seen the thunderstorm development. So some of these are probably a little bit overestimated due to the hail contamination. And certainly as you get into portions of southwest Iowa where we see these little red spots, that definitely is a hail contamination issue. But for the remainder of the state, the areas that are in white, less than a half an inch for the entire month, so well below normal. So as we look at what the jet stream is doing today, we see the zonal flow. We have a low that's going to rapidly move across the Dakotas today and generate some snowfall, potentially moving into northeastern Nebraska, where we have the ability maybe of an inch or so of moy or snowfall. And then we start to see the cold air penetrate in for Saturday as a couple of lows move down the system. That's going to generate some snowfall across central Nebraska and possibly holding into the day on early Monday before the cold air really starts to sag in and the main storm track moves up toward the Great Lakes regions as we get into Tuesday. That may give eastern Nebraska a shot of snowfall. Then the real cold air moves into the Great Lakes. We start to see ridging on Wednesday taken into our region, but we're only going to see a slight modification in temperatures until we get to Thursday. And then we start to see more zonal flow. Temperatures will start to increase toward the freezing mark. And then we start to see the t systems moving into the western United States driving a fairly decent trough that will actually increase our temperatures we go into next weekend, but the flip side is we'll be dealing with a storm system moving out into the central plains that has the potential to create some pretty significant weather. So as we take a look at the precipitation as we go through today, you'll see this narrow track of snow across northeast Nebraska. Then on Sunday, the system starts to get organized across the central Rockies and shoots rapidly out as we get into Monday and Tuesday. So we'll generate some snowfall. You can catch the southeastern portion of the state right now is showing this, but I think we'll see a more widespread precipitation event. In fact, we're looking at up to a quarter inch of moisture with this, so that would be about two inches. And then as we go on Thursday, the system starts to organize in the western United States and starts to make its way into the central Rockies on Friday, only to sweep out into the central plains as we get into next week. And in terms of the 8 to 14 day forecast, the cold weather starts to shunt to our east. Notice the warmth starting to show up. By mid-month, it may start to move into our region. And in terms of precipitation, the main active storm band will remain to our north and across the eastern United States. Thanks, Al. Today's interviews are available individually on the Market Journal website and through the Market Journal mobile app. They include information on cattle markets, the potential for ag exports to China, the renewable fuel standard, and costs of production. As always, you can keep up with Market Journal during the week by following us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Next week, Roy Smith will be our corn and soybean market analyst. Until then, thanks for watching. From the 2016 Power Farming Show, I'm Jeff Wilkerson. We'll see you next week. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine, and major funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Corn Board. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources.